All right, well, wait for this thing to load up. Uh, any question about the midterm or any suggestions by midterm? But the final will be very similar in every format. And uh, one thing is that the final will probably have more programming questions, right? similar to the last homework or the homework you just handed in. Yeah, go ahead. I just have a question about the last uh, question from the last homework. Mm -hmm. I'm, I, I'm not sure about how to do it. Yeah. Which question? Uh, it looks about uh, we have a wind energy plant and we have to mount a battery. Right. So I, I wasn't sure about how to do Yeah, that. so that you will not be able to do another, right? It's basically it's try simulations. So try different parameters and see how it works. So let me pull up the exact question and talk through that question. Right, so this is saying you have a battery, right? So what the battery can do is can charge and discharge power. So one is you need to find a charging rule. So this is problem seven. And so what this asks you to do is basically we know that you have a wind farm. So let's say you have some wind farm, a Gaussian with zero mean, five megawatt mean, one megawatt standard deviation. Or I guess one mega, yeah, so one mega less than deviation. And then we're going to connect this to a battery. And we're going to look at the output of this battery. And we want this output to be a smoother, to be a smoother output. So, first of all, if the thing to recognize that if this is a random, right, so if this is some, anything random with mean of five, can you change the mean of the output? Could you ever change the average of the thing that comes out of the battery? No, right? Because conservation of energy. Okay, whatever goes in has come out. Battery does not generate power, so the mean will be fine. That's why the question doesn't ask you to do anything about the mean. Okay, there's nothing you can do about this mean. This is five, this is five. Okay, so the question, but you could reduce standard deviation. Okay, you could reduce standard deviation. So the mean, Right, so this is just conservation of energy. Okay. So now the next way to think about this problem is to say, what if I have an infinite battery? Okay, so if a battery that's infinite in size, that means can store any amount of energy you want, as long as as long as sort of whatever goes in eventually comes out of the battery. So if the battery is infinite, then what is a good strategy to reduce? the variance at the output. Now let's say assume infinite capacity battery. So I have a battery, this thing has infinite capacity. Now let's say I have some power. So this is sort of random power, right? Some random power going in. I want the alpha to be a constant. What can I do? So first of all, what it wishes that if the alpha is a constant, what value must it take? Five, right? It has to take five, right? So if I want the alpha to be a constant, it has to be five because the gun cost of energy has five has come out at the end of the day. So one way to make this five is to say, so the now define, let's say B at time T as the battery charge or discharge, okay? So we have some variable that determines how much goes into the battery, it comes out of the battery. But one way to make this alpha roughly constant with the infinite battery is to do the following. Okay, so let's say this is P, okay, so P equals to, what do you do? Well, so you want this to be five. So let's say,
the mean. So what do you do? Well, so your battery, right? So this is, will be, you simply subtract this off. Okay, so if it's more than five, you dump that into the battery. If it's less than five, you provide from the battery. Okay, so the way to do this, uh, this the action on the battery will be, right? So if the input is larger than five, you dump it, you store in the battery. Right, you pull this out. Okay, so this is storing, this is discharging. Okay, so because you have an infinite battery, you can always do this. Okay, right? so if you, let's say you're, you know, you start off the battery, you run for a while, uh, you, then you have an infinite battery, this you can always do. So this is your action and the output will be a constant. Right, you have an output, constant output. Uh, sort of as time goes on. Okay, so this will be a five. So P will eventually go to five as time goes on. Okay, so th this will be the condition we have. And now the Okay, so if you don't have an infinite battery, you have to make some allowances. Basically, what happens is you don't have an infinite battery, uh, you may not able to do this. You can run out of power or you can push too much power onto the battery, okay? So if you don't have an infinite battery, what you have to look at is you still have this kind of rules of sort of if we don't have capacity. If at capacity do nothing, right? There's some energy combat storage capacity in the battery. This is, so you're limited at this point to not doing anything. So as you basically, what you do is you can start off with a very large capacity. Okay, eventually your standard deviation will be zero. You keep going this. So you squeeze the capacity to be, or you can smaller and smaller. You see a larger variation at the output. So sometimes you run into capacity. So at a point, the standard deviation will be the one requiring the question. And you can just read that number off. Okay, so there is a way, so if you see the scale chain, you can actually compute this explicitly, but uh, you don't need to. So you through simulations. So once you set the simulation up, you can actually run through this very, very quickly to see what happens. Okay, okay. yeah, so this is the idea with the last problem. And the last homework is you have, first of all, you have to determine this is a roof. And this is sort of obvious roof. There's not much you can do other than this roof. Okay. So because again, if it's, you have more power than the mean, putting to the battery, you have less power in the mean, drive from the battery. And here you have capacity. Okay. So the capacity will determine the variation of the output. And uh, no, there is a capacity that works. All right, so this is the idea with that question. So you won't be able, you won't get this type of question on the final, this is a little bit tricky. But in the final, you will have this for simulation. You have to do, right? you have to be able to simulate what happens, this kind of setting. Okay. All right, so this is the question there. So this shows for one, that's the reason that question is we want to get into batteries. And this is one way to use battery. And to smooth out the output. Okay, so battery never provides a gain. In, battery will never help you to increase the average of something. But that's not what the battery does, right? Battery is basically smoothing out. Okay. So before talking to batteries, we want to look at you know solar as well. So solar, right? So we talk a lot about wind, but all the calculation we've been doing on probability and things like that applies equally to solar. Well, the difference that solar is typically much smaller than scale than wind. For wind nowadays, we're turning towards things like 10 megawatts. Solar, you're still looking at tens, you know, things like kilowatts or tens of kilowatt range. Okay. Yeah, so most solars that's deployed in the US, at least uh, this kind of rooftop solar, right, goes through a 
conversion converts to test the DC power conversion. So uh, offers DC power converts to AC power, then goes into a hole. Right. So if you follow the news in California, whether you can sell back to the grid or how will you sell back to the grid is generating a huge amount of uh, controversy, basically. What, you know, do you allow this or not? But for this, for now, we'll just look at solar as some you know, random power that can be generated. Okay. So solar, as we said last time, is solar has a benefit of complementing what? So if you have a lot of solar, typically, or in this picture, right? So this shows the solar resources. Basically, this part where we don't have a lot of wood, you have a lot of solar. Or this part, you have a lot of wood, you don't have that much solar. So it's a good compliment. Well, the, you know, sometimes the problem is, you know, where people live, there may be not a lot of solar or wood. So there's also a question, how do you pull resources together, but at least they cancel out some wood. They balance each other out some wood. So, okay. so one type of solar we don't consider is this called, called concentrated solar. Can you guys see this, right? Okay, all right. It's called concentrated solar. So what this does, this does not generate like electricity. Okay, so what does this, this does is you have a lot of mirrors and heats up something in the middle. Uh, not water, water typically doesn't have a high enough heat capacity, but something else. And that can be used to generate power. Okay, so we're not gonna consider this type of solar because there's actually not much randomness in here because you have a such big sort of heat sink. So this will smooth out, right? You just need to heat this thing up and uh, this will uh, sort of supply power for a while. Okay, so you do see this kind of concentrated solar, but it's another thing we worry about, right? Is it true that So you typically need quite a bit of, you know, solar radiation to make this work well. On all those places, well, this will smooth out for a day. So this typically, for example, salt. So you melt salt here, and that has a very high heat capacity. So we'll keep heat for a, you know, a day for sure. So once you have, you know, this is natural storage in, in the generation. So you have that kind of storage, then this is fine. Okay, so this is solar and wind, and all this is basically, both solar and wind creates this mismatch between supply and demand, right? So if you look at demand, so let's think of our demand profile. So let's say you have a day, daily pattern 0 to 24. So what demand tends to look like is demand tends to have this so-called double P shape. So this is when people sort of wake up and then they go to work and then you have this sort of, uh, let me draw this better. You have this sort of afternoon ramp and then this comes down. This is our demand shape. That's typically the, how the demand looks like. But if you look at things like solar, uh, solar does not follow this shape. What solar does is solar tends to do this. Right, solar is high in the middle of the day. And then by the time people come home, solar, uh, you know, solar is typically not generating that much power. So this is a big mismatch. And uh, this is actual data from uh, Pacific Gas Electric showing one of their days where they, so this is average household power consumption and the household load so it just, you know, it's not where the solar is. Okay, you would much rather this thing gets moved this way, or this thing gets moved this way, but they just, right now they don't lie on it. Okay. And this creates a problem for, for power system. And the problem it creates is this kind of famous, very, very famous California duck curve. Okay, so this is like, have people seen this curve before? Yeah, so we should have probably all seen this curve before. It's called a duck curve. It looks like a duck. So this is the head of the duck. This is the tail. This is the belly of the duck. Okay, so if you work in this space, you're very tired of seeing this curve. I've seen this curve a thousand times. And what this trend show is, look, 
in 2013, this is very flat shape. And 2020, what happens is this has a huge dip at the middle of the day coming from solar. And this is a net load. So this dips at the middle of the day, and then ramps up by sort of you know, 4 or 5 PM, when solar goes down and low goes up. So this adds up and peaks here. Okay? So this is called the dark curve. So why is this a problem? Why, if you're a power system engineer, you hate this curve? Right, it's this ramp. It's how do you handle this ramp? Okay, so this ramp, this is a very steep ramp. This, this ramp creates a lot of problems because what ramps fast, right? So if you think about what actually ramps that fast is you either need a lot of gas, peaking gas plants to hit this ramp, or you need to keep a lot of other slower power plants on standby and turn them on once you hit this ramp. Okay, so the thing to remember is, you know, question is, it's not like this thing is not predictable. We sort of know this ramp will happen. It's just what do you do with this ramp, right? So, uh, you know, California is still quite of a nuclear. Nuclear is not gonna respond anywhere close to this time scale. If you have something, even if you have gas combined cycle, it doesn't ramp this fast. So you basically have to keep things on and not generate power so that they, they don't need to do a cold start when they handle this ramp. Okay, so it's very hard to hit the ramp. How to sort of deal with this ramp using conventional generation. Okay, so this is quite a bit of challenge. So this is called a famous star curve. And what the consequences of this creates this kind of prices. Okay, so this is the real, this is the electricity price in California. So you can read this as dollars per megawatt. So to write this, so this is 30, this is 50, this is about five dollars per megawatt. Okay, so this creates this kind of prices. And this price, so if you generate power, for example, here, you get you know, 50, a little bit more than $50 per megawatt, here you get five. So you get this huge dynamic range in power price generation. And this has several consequences. One is nobody that wants to keep their power plant on at this time. It is not worth it. And this creates a perverse incentive of not having solar. Because what solar does is solar starts not to push down the price. Right. The more solar I have, the lower the price is. Because again, solar does not take any money to actually generate power. Right. So this you know, could be going negative you now, depending on a few years. And then there's a really perverse incentive of not having solar. Now, he will be happier from a make money making perspective is to get rid of this, which push this whole thing out. Okay. And uh, you know, there's what so if you just allow this to keep going, then essentially solar, solar will go out of the market. It doesn't make sense to put money into solar. Okay. So this is the challenge that uh, we're facing today. So you can imagine other places, you know, California has solar, but for places like Illinois or the Midwest, think of wind. This is a similar picture called solar. wind. And when you have a lot of wind, it's not when you want power. When you have a lot of solar, it's not when you want power. And uh, eventually the market has to make sense. So, it's a sub so right now, a lot of solar is mandated or you know, incentivized and all that. But once you run out of those money, then this curve really sort of slows the development of renewable, right? Of solar and wind. Okay. So storage, right, has a big, uh, has been talked about for many years as a solution to this problem. Because you cannot tell people when to consume power you cannot tell nature when to generate power. So what, what can you do? Right? So storage, basically, this is moves load or generation in time. Okay, so just as a transmission line moves load or generation in space, 
storage is something that move load transmission in time. Okay, so that, you know, if I could shift load around, that makes the dot curve much better. Okay, that will make the, or even now the price will make uh, things much, much easier from the grid perspective. Okay, so the good storage is not like we did not have storage before. Okay, so it's important to think of storage in a time scale, right? So if we're moving things in time, it's useful to think of how long of a time scale we're moving things in. Just like transmission lines. How long is the transmission line? Here is how long, what is the time scale? So our time scale is drawing on a log scale. So it goes from seconds, hours, days, so really what we have right now is we have storage on both extremes of this timeline. So we're, we have storage on both extremes. So on one extreme of very small, very sort of small time intervals, this is mechanical, this is for mechanical inertia we have. So think back to the type four turbines we've been talking about for synchronous generator. This is mechanical inertia, so we have storage here. It's not like we don't have this storage. Okay, this way, through. so on days we have two types of storage, quote unquote storage. This, for example, is hydro. Right, pump hydro. It works for days, and the second is simply just schedule. Okay, we can plan and schedule things days in advance. That we can do. Market can take care of that. Okay, so we have things that. That's really this middle part. That's our COA open question. Are you waiting for technology to, to come to the middle part and deal with it? Okay, so this is a question mark. And uh, this class will be addressing storage that deals with this type of I think of from the second level, second time scale to the hours time scale. So th this is a time scale. We care about storage. Okay. It doesn't mean that these are not important. Right? So it's very important to have longer time storage, very important to have mechanical inertia, but this class will deal with the middle spectrum storage. Okay. Right, so specific to the Pacific Northwest, if you go work for places like uh, Tacoma, Carolina Light, your whole life may be dealing with hydro. And uh, we're talking with them to finally restart sporting again. So be on the lookout for email next quarter, going to visit the hydro station. So we'll start to see the sort of physical assets they have. And they, so hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll talking about how, how exactly do that for safety and different reasons, but we'll start doing this again. And hopefully we'll again, be able, also be able to show you, for example, Arlington Microgrid, where you see this type of storage. So we're trying to start all the things again. Right, so storage, so for this class, we'll talk about things in the middle. Right. And uh, what does is, again, storage, what you really want to do is to smooth out the output. Okay. Because, right, so this one example, again, this is a real trace of solar. And this is what you call a good solar day. Right. There's, there's small variations, but very, fairly flat ramps up, fairly flat ramps down. So this is a very good solar day. This is a not a very good solar day for the same place. Okay, so this is in May, this is in March, exact same location, same panel, different rig. Yeah, not sure. So you're not sure which what what you will get. And then really the hope is you no know, with storage, can you flatten this thing out? Okay, can you make it appear flatter than it really is? That, that's a hope with storage. And things being flatter and more consistent has a lot of value for us. That's a lot of value for power supply operations. Okay. So how do we think about storage? So let's think of different models, right? So let's think of uh, different technologies. So then we have pump hydro being still the predominant type of storage in the US. By far, our most storage capacity is in hydro. 
And what pump hydro means is you find a lake and you pump water to it. Okay, you find a place that uh, you find a lake that sort of has high elevation and uh, pump water up. So this is actually economical because water is there. Right? You don't need to buy water, you have water. And uh, the storage, formal storage is very natural. The way of generation is very natural. You can generate it as you're running a hydroelectric power plant. So that's very economic. If you can do pump hydro, you would do pump hydro. It really doesn't make sense to do something else. You can do pump hydro. It just, we cannot do it for a lot of places, right? So it's just very constrained. It's very, very constrained. So what we have is next, we have, you know, the next most typical time of storage is lead acid. This is being phased out, both for environmental reasons and for it doesn't ramp all that fast. Okay, so lead acid is you know, going away. Next we have, Right. So the most common type of storage we have is this amaya, or the, I guess not common, but the most competitive form of storage we have now is this amaya, this is popular. Right. This is competitive. Right. So this is the battery, for example, in your phone, you know, in your computer, this is amaya. Have people heard of any other type of storage? In this? Beyond lithium ion, have you heard of other battery technologies? Okay. Capacitor, right? Super capacitor. Okay, it's a large capacitor. So it's definitely a form of technology we have. Anything else? Okay. Probably a battery, but like hydrogen. Hydrogen, fuel cell, right? So hydrogen fuel cell. Which is a form of energy storage, I guess. So you, you can store energy from hydrogen. Anything else? Okay, so now, right now, after list of ion, a popular class of battery people are looking at is less of metal. Okay, so lithium ion, so we'll go into the chemistry a little bit of a lithium ion. Lithium metal is a one, still use lithium, but using a metal electric or metal uh, as a as cathode, this has higher capacity. The problem with this one, uh, this one tends to catch on fire. <laughs> so this one has higher capacity, higher power output, higher all that, it uh, tends to start fire. So this morning uh, from six to eight, I was on a call about what to do with this battery. So I will call the company, you know, using sort of learning and doing different things about this battery, but this sort of coming along. And then we have something called redox flow. This is another type of battery. What this does is it doesn't use sort of a lot of metal electrolytes to convert. Let's just use type of liquid electrolytes and you put them in your closed loop system and they can react, they will create electricity. Okay. And then you have things like, so flywheel is another big uh, thing we have. So flywheel is exactly what you think it is. It's just a big giant spinning wheel. You turn it, this thing has now mechanical inertia and uh, you can pull power out of that way. Okay, so all, all these are storage technologies that's around. Okay, so what we want to do is we want to sort of have a way to think about this, right? We want to have a way to think about this different technology. So we want some model that's roughly, you know, captures different type of storage, so unify them a little bit and not having Right. So if you work in chemistry, this is completely different, let's say, from to this. Okay, they're completely different chemistries. From an electrical engineering point of view, we want something that captures all these. So you don't want to think of the individual chemistries, 
I would think of them as a sort of box, as a block diagram. So our model will be, this is our battery. Okay, this is still our battery. As I'm powering, there's some power up. Okay, so fundamentally, this is what our battery is. This has finite capacity. This is uh, the sort of the simplest model we can have of a battery. You can put in different technology there. For example, different technology will determine different capacity of your battery, right? Pump hydro will have a very different capacity than say super capacity. So this is our uh, battery model. And uh, for the last homework question, right? Yeah, but we basically start with this model. This is not a terrible model to work with. A lot of studies in power is uses this kind of battery box. It's just a box that can take in power, can output power, has some finite compassion. So we can put in more uh, things around this box, right? More practical considerations around this box. For example, the power rating. So how fast can you rent, can the power in and power out be? What is the limit on the amount of power you can push in versus the amount of power you can get out? Okay. Power rating, for example, so lithium ion, that's a high power rating. Flow for fuel cell, lower rating. Okay. So this is the idea we have. And normally you can think of this as a kilowatt per second or a kilowatt, actually, so not per second. This is a limit on the power. So how much power can I get out of this battery? A fuel cell will take you a while to get power out of it, or this amount can come out very, very quickly. So power rating is a one big thing we think about when we talk about battery. Another thing we think about is efficiency. Okay, do I lose any power between powering and power out? So this is a measure of power you get out versus power you get in. So it will never be 100% efficient, but sometimes you have much bigger losses. So for example, this is a flow, that's high efficiency. Which one of the technology we talked about would you think has the lowest efficiency in terms of uh, what comes in versus what comes out? Okay. No, this is actually not that bad. This is not bad. Super capacitor does not do terribly well <laughs> because you leave it alone, the power goes away. When you charge a capacitor, you leave it for half a second. Yeah, no power. It just leaks, right? So you always, you actually leak when you're super compressor. Super compressor does not typically have very good efficiency. Okay? It's because you can't use it that often. But, yeah. right, you're right, so it depends on time scale, but nothing in our application actually is that fast in terms of super compressor. So you have something that's, you know, just goes up and down all the time, and super compressor is a great application. But in the time, you know, in the, even in 10 millisecond time scale, super compressor is not super great for that. And so, the, yes, so depend on time scale, but for example, you have your know, super capacitor, a lower efficiency, right? So it's not terribly efficient. One big thing is safety. You know, don't catch on fire, right? So do not, do not start a fire. Do not have chemical leaks that uh, kill people and all that. So all of these, for example, right? So. So that asset, one reason this is being phased out is not very safe from a long-term perspective. Uh, flow battery has a problem as a chemical using flow, electrolytes using flow battery is very toxic. So you have to close this whole thing, putting a swimming pool and make sure nobody ever goes close to this. There's a metal tends to catch on fire, whereas you know, this is safer, this MIO will get pretty good. So safety is very concerning. And the most complex, so safety is complicated, but you know, sometimes a very something that's very complicated is so-called capacity. 
A capacity fade, this means that your battery degrades as you use it. So, you know, we all experience this, right? You have a cell phone that uh, loses battery. The battery is not as good as you. So this, once you use it, you lose it. And this, what this does, this tells you the operational cost. So battery is not really a free resource. Right? Every time you use a battery, you degrade the battery. So you have, you, you experience some cost. Right? You cannot just keep on using a battery. Right? So the, this is the biggest problem with this amount. As we degrade the battery, we use it, you have to throw out your battery after a few years. So that's why electric vehicles are so expensive. It's also because it's capacity fading problem. You have to buy a giant battery just because after a few years, you want to drive your car. Then the bigger battery is more, has more weight, so you have less efficiency, all that is problem. So this is, this a myon, so it has a high degradation. Or something like flow, or supercapacitor, this lower degradation. So these are the examples, right? So of, uh, of sort of batteries, so all the considerations. So think of battery basically as a box with numbers attached to them. The battery is this box with numbers meaning capacity, the power rating, the efficiency, the degradation. Right? So that, that's our way of thinking about it. It's a box parameterized by all the numbers. Right. So that's that's so we give a different technology, we want to characterize all these numbers. So and for different applications, some numbers may be more important than others. Okay. So this is the way sort of abstract way of thinking the battery. Because right. again, think of the box characterized by a bunch of numbers telling you how good the box is. But okay. so one thing we'll not say anything more is these sort of mechanical batteries. So both flywheels and compressed air are mechanical batteries. And these is a little bit are not, uh, not on the sort of cutting edge of things. Okay, so what this is, the good flywheel is you spin this thing. You have a mass, you spin the mass and you can generate electricity. So that can be used somewhere. Compressed air, again, similarly, as uh, you, put air into an underground cavern. And because this is compressed, you can turn a turbine if you pull the air up, you compress it. And so all of these are not, you know, they are used at different places. They're not sort of the cutting edge of battery technology. Again, this is very constrained by where you are. If you have this kind of natural storage places, you can do compressed air. If not, it's just very hard to do compressed air. And so starting from now, we'll be going to sort of chemistry much more. We'll look at lithium ion batteries. Because again, these are the most uh, popular in all this. Right? These are the ones that we think will make a big difference in smoothing our renewables. And so we'll look at lithium ion chemistries. And if you ever work in this space, you'll see all these symbols. And so what these symbols mean is basically lithium. So they all start with lithium. And this is something else, lithium plus something else. Okay, so this is what all the uh, names mean. And different technologies works uh, for different uh, applications. Okay. So your laptop uses, for example, this type of lithium cobalt oxide device. And when you look for, as you look for things, for example, the reason your laptop uses this is has very high specific energy. What does this mean? I don't remember. What does high specific energy mean? Good. Right, this is sort of kilowatt hour per weight or per space. Right, high energy capacity, high specific energy means I can store a lot of energy in a small amount of weight and space. Okay, so for laptops and your phone, right, this is most important. Right, you want to be lightweight. Right? You want to be lightweight, you want to be small, to use this kind of technology. And then you have uh, 
that's for different other different technologies that's used more electric vehicles where you don't need that high of specific energy but maybe you need more safety and you think you want things to be safer or you want things to last longer so your phone doesn't last as long this is not very good for the battery life actually so that degrades fast this the battery lifetime will last longer but uh, you sort of lose a little bit of specific energy and the rest we'll see in this sort of new chemistry coming up. Right? We're having new chemistry coming up just for different, uh, for different chemistry have different properties. Okay. So if you work in chemistry, like, you know, your life is specifically one of these and develop the batteries. For us, it's still good to know what type of batteries are out there. It's good to know lithium, good to know, good to know what type of batteries are out there. So these are the different types of uh, batteries we have. So all of this, uh, so so you can think of this as, as different cathodes. So if you really want to be technical, lithium is the anode of the battery. This is the cathode of whatever the cathode is made of. It's given by this name. Okay, so this is a picture of a big, I think this is lithium. Maybe nickel, actually, I think this may be nickel for Snohomish PUD. So this is the actual picture of a battery, Snohomish PUD, precious. This, so all those batteries, grid scale batteries, come in this kind of shipping container. And uh, you're not supposed to open this container stuff for safety reasons, you don't open it. So you know, funny story is we actually got a battery, we got a million dollars to buy a battery on campus, but could not find a place to put a shipping container. On campus, we you know they we can't put it out. So it's actually safe. It doesn't matter for the outside. Then you know they won't. You know, where will you put a big shipping container outside on campus? And then we thought about putting it, you know, in the E building. You know the reason why they said no for putting the battery in the E building? It's a fire hazard for the student. <laughs> <laughs> it's an experimental battery, right? We want to do some experiments using the building power and doing, you know, voltage regulation, all that. We got it. It's okay. It's a fire hazard. Like, what guarantee do you have this won't burn the building? <laughs> yeah, so we have a CSE to burn the other building. CSE2, right? CSE2, okay. Put this on the basement. CSE2. <laughs> so, I mean, this is just sort of the scale of battery. So, we, you know, we have to return the money and then we cannot buy a battery. Right, so this, if you're looking at this, this will be probably hundreds of kilowatt hours. So you're looking at this sort of this kind of data, yeah. Hundreds, hundreds of kilowatt hours. This yeah. So, yeah. so they're getting different technology, but batteries are big. Like grid type scale storage batteries are very, very big. They, they're not small looking things. Okay. Yeah, so we tried, we couldn't. So now our projects are more towards the home age and Tacoma. Places where you have places for batteries like this. So, yeah, they're very against putting batteries in basements of buildings for understanding work. So, this is an example of battery. That's the one battery we have. So, an important thing for battery is C rate. Okay, so, if you ever work in the battery space, you'll hear this a lot. You know, first, when you look at any battery, you'll talk about you know, what's the C rate of your battery. So C rate is a standard measure. The C comes from charging. Okay. C comes from charging. That's why it's called a C rate. And the standard to this way. So one C, okay, so one C is a battery charges from empty to full. in one hour, okay? So this is called a one C rate. This is a standardized measure of uh, how fast a battery can charge, okay? So this is called, so this going from zero, the battery is completely empty, to the battery is 100% full in one hour, it's called one C. So 
k-c, right? You have things like 2c, 3c, 4c, this kind of things. This is the battery charges uh, in one over k hours. Okay, so the higher the c, the higher the k, the faster the battery charges. Okay, so 2c is some battery that are charging half an hour, and 3c is something that are charging 20 minutes. This is called a C rate. So, uh, for example, 2C is full charge in half an hour. 1 over 24C is full charge in a day. Okay, so this is a C rate. So, typically, when you buy a battery, we'll have a fastest C rate attached to the battery. So your phone is probably, you know, sometimes around one C. So your phone is one C, your computer is probably half C, this kind of rating. So it's very atypical to see something that's faster than two C. Anything, so faster C rate has safety issues. It's not, you know, you're pushing a lot of current through the battery. And faster C rate tends to degrade the battery quite a bit. So when you have a, if you can do slower charging, you'll do a uh, slow rate. You do a sort of small C rate. But this is just good terminology to know because once you start reading anything of batteries, you'll see this C rate number. They just tell you what C rate is. Okay. So this is just the one C is full charging one now. That's a standard uh, unit we look to for charging rates. Okay. So. Right, so if you charge on discharge, this is what things look like. So it could just give you an idea of charging and discharging. So you can look at the different C rate, right? So one C, what happens is you basically, you're putting a high voltage, you have a high, very high voltage. You try to drive current charging to the battery. You're offering high voltage. One thing we are discharging, you offer a much lower voltage. Because now you want the current to come out of the battery. Right, so you basically have a very low terminal voltage, so you push current out of the battery. So this is one C. And uh, if you have a smaller C rate, so if you have a smaller C rate, you sort of charge and discharge a less aggressive cycle. And this also, you can, so if you're familiar with this kind of curve, you can see where the degradation comes. Right, when, when do you have degradation? It's when it goes through this very large cycle, this kind of you know, high C rate cycle, you have a lot of stress on the battery. Right? When you have all this kind of stress, you tend to degrade the material. So think of you know, metal stress, right? something bending a lot, whereas if you're bending a much smaller, lower charging rate, they have less stress. Okay? So think of this as a fatigue or stress on the battery. Okay? So there's one of them, less a mile. This is fairly commonly seen. And then you'll see different things in the flow battery. So we won't go through this, but Sort of similar ideas for different C rates, you push different voltage ratings into the battery. Okay, so modeling, right? So modeling for typically for, I guess, this is electrochemical. So electrochemical battery means listen something. Okay, think of this as listen X, whatever as a castle for lithium. The good thing was this kind of modeling for battery storage is there's no minimum generation. Minimum load, start up. Shut off, cost. And we just don't have this type of considerations, right? So unlike a power plant, which can which has to operate above through the minimum power level for battery, you don't need to do that. It can operate at any power level. There's no minimum load. There's no startup cost. No, there's very little anything of like that. Ramping is typically not a problem.
especially for lithium-based batteries. It's, you typically, you very, very rarely you ever encounter an application where you need to think about ramping. Okay, so ramping is not a huge deal. You can, the chemistry in the battery can ramp very, very fast. Okay, so that's all ramping for milliseconds for us. So operating cost. So unlike wind and solar, where you can essentially completely disregard operating cost, battery you cannot disregard operating cost, right? So one we saw is degradation cost, the more you use it, sort of the worse the battery is. So you lose battery while using it. So that's by definition an operating cost. Okay, you have to, if you use it, you lose some money. I can think of some, uh, there's one other big operating cost, actually. Can you think of the example for operating cost? Another reason to have a big operating cost? No, so that's a capital cost. I know that's, sort of, that's not an offering. So what, what is the cost that you have to pay while you use it? Okay, so a big cost that you know, sometimes is not obvious is air conditioning cost. And this sometimes can cost a lot of money to cool the battery. But you have to mix the battery. Again, this comes down to safety a lot of times. And you have to cool the battery enough. One, it doesn't catch fire. Two, if your battery is very hot, can tend to degrade very fast. You have to make sure the battery is running at a reasonable temperature it's going at. So this is the air conditioning. Oh, yeah, so that's not operating cost, right? It's just there. It will break down anyways, while I use it or not. So we'll just consider more of the operating cost. How much should I use the battery? So there'll be some lifetime loss if the, you know, if the battery is installed, but that typically doesn't enter the calculation because that's you know, incurred no matter what. Okay. So these are the two big operating costs you have. So we have constraints. One is a power rating. A lot of times this is a power electronic rating. So a lot of times this is, you have inverters on the battery, like how much the inverter allows you to power out the battery in terms of power. So this is kilowatts, in terms of kilowatts, we have energy rating. So this is just how big the battery is, measuring kilowatt hours. So when you try some ways, so our goal is to get to some equations we can write down. And the equation we can write down is basically you know, minimizing this cost subject to this constraint. So you have some constraints, and some cost, you want to choose some out, you know, you, well, let's say you want to balance renewable generation, so we'll try to write down those type of equations. So there's a lot of setup to eventually get there. So actually, let's see. Okay, so let's take a break now, then we'll go into a lot more detail about these things. Right? For example, how, you know, do you think of, how do you put a number on derivation cost, this kind of thing? Okay, so let's take a break, come back at uh, 10, uh, 9, 33. Okay, so if you look at these things, the, these considerations, right? So we'll try to get to equations describing this. So out of all these numbers, the hardest thing to figure out is this degradation cost because power rating is typically given to you. Or you're limited to say 10 kilowatt, right? That, that's your power electronics rating. Energy rating is given to you by a battery, will tell you what this is. Air conditioning cost is just to add it on constant cost, that's it. But this thing that's hardest to figure out. So a lot of you know, modeling, for example, in the past three, four years, at least in the power engineering side, is you figuring out what to do with degradation cost. How do you put it? How do you get an equation that sort of makes sense for it? 
So here we're gonna look at the simplest way to model this. So the simplest model way to model this is we have a, so a battery is typically pressurized, uh, typically for, I guess. has a limited number of cycles. Okay, so what does a cycle mean? As if you think of take a battery, and that's, let's say this is a zero, this is 100% full. And uh, if you buy a battery, well, on the warranty will tell you this battery can undergo something like 5,000 cycles. A cycle means going from this kind of, this is one cycle in terms of that, okay? So you have to go from, you know, either zero to 100, coming back, or from 100 to zero, come back again. This is called a one full cycle in charging battery, okay? So you undergo this cycle. So this is called one cycle. And the battery, the warranty sheet will tell you something like, a battery has 5,000 cycles. Okay, we'll tell you something like this, right? We'll tell you the starter will live for this long. After 5,000 cycles, what you should do is you throw the battery off. And okay, this sort of limited life of batteries. So the idea for cost calculation is now to do this. Okay, so you have, so what we do is we have, let's say we have you know, X units of charge and discharge. Okay, so undergo X units of charge and discharge, so undergo some cycling in the application of the battery. And the way you look at this is, this will be X over the capacity of the battery, right? So let's say you undergo a 60% cycle, so there'll be a half. Multiplied by the battery cost, the amount of money it took you to buy the battery divide by the total cycles in the battery. And so what you can, what you see this as the cost per cycle. Okay, so this is the cost per cycle. And this is the amount of a fraction of cycle you have used. And you multiply this, you get a cost of doing this much harder than this hard. Okay, for example, this is 100%. You did 10% of the cycle, so it's one tenth of the battery cost divided by the numbers of cycles the battery can undergo. Okay. And so the good thing is all these numbers, when you buy a battery, it will tell you this number. It will tell you how big a cycle is, the capacity of the battery. You know this, how big this is. It will tell you how much cycle it is, how much cycle it has, it will tell you what the battery cost is. Okay, so this is the, so a very uh, simple way of computing the cost of operating a battery. All right, so this is, so a lot of calculations, for example, nowadays people do is we'll have this type of uh, operating cost for battery building to it. And often this is actually a lot of times you get this metric, you get this number in terms of dollars per cycle. So often you got a unit of dollar per cycle. How much, how much cost does it take to operate the battery in one cycle? Okay, so, so often this will be dollar per cycle of battery usage. Okay. So that'll be, for example, battery cost divided by total cycles that vary from this group. So there is, so this is very interesting because the challenge is, so if, for example, if you're cycling and something like this, then it very much makes a lot of sense to talk about how many cycles you have undergo in this application. In most real practical uh, situations, your cycling does not look like that. In practice, what happens, right, so you have cycle that, you know, does something like this. Okay, so this is your cycle. Right? 
But a lot of effort has been made to say, what exactly is a cycle? Yeah, so a lot of things, a lot of times in practice, you have to be fun. I have, a, I have a cost of dollar per cycle. How many cycles do this thing undergo? What, what, what is a cycle? <laughs> and so there is a way to count this kind of things. Again, this, kind, this area grows a lot from the uh, material stress, metal, metal stress area, basically. So if you're interested, you can look up this rain flow algorithm. So rain flow is an algorithm that counts cycles for us. We have an irregular cycle. We use something called rain flow or similar to rain flow to count number of cycles. So I won't go through the rain flow algorithm here. You can look this up on Wikipedia, for example. We have this kind of algorithm. But one thing just knowing practice is the cycles are never this regular cycle. Most cycles are of this sort of weird shape. And uh, counting it, uh, there is algorithm. So it's non trivial to factor this algorithm into the uh, operations. But for now, in this class, so we'll just assume things undergo very nice looking even cycles. <laughs> in practice, they don't look like that. So that's okay. So more of interest is how do I know how many cycles I have left? Right? So the another interesting thing we need to do is measuring battery capacity. Because let's say you have a battery, you used it, you know, after for a year or so, and you want to know how much actually cycles can my battery last, right? How long can my battery last? So how much capacity of the battery do I have left? And this is actually not a trivial question. This is a very hard question that people are trying to figure out. Because again, when you use your battery, right, you see some profile like this. You actually don't know what the limit of the battery is. So you don't know how much battery you have left because you, you don't undergo this sort of deep cycles. right? You don't know how much battery you have left. So the metric capacity, what we often do, and we do this in our labs, for example, if you go to the material science engineering folks that have a lot of battery cyclers, and what they do is one way is to do one over 24 C charging. As you charge this battery very, very, very slowly, and uh, you cycle it, and you see what's the upper limit. The, when the battery will not charge anymore. Okay, so you can measure capacity this way. There's a lot of interest in acoustic measurements, actually using acoustics to look inside what the battery looks like and the measure capacity, measure degradation. And uh, really what we want to do, which we cannot reliably do now is you want to tell this from voltage measurements. Okay, so what we really want nowadays is, can I tell how much, what's the health of the battery? And how much, how, much charge, how much charging capacity I have left by simply measuring the voltage or current at the output of the battery. Okay, so this is, for example, how your computer, how your phone, or try to estimate it. That's a terrible estimate. Okay, your phone, your electric vehicle, all that, that doesn't have a very good idea how much battery is actually there. So often what happens is you have a battery, you only use about say half of the actual capacity you can use because they are being very conservative in this kind of measure. Okay, so the really what push people are trying to push towards is can I tell the say the health of the battery by just in, using voltage and current, things I can easily measure. Uh, not quite there yet. So we have acoustic, this is very accurate, this is very accurate, but obviously this takes time. And this, you don't have a battery, actually. So, it's, so these are the type of things we can do to measure battery. Uh, for, our, for this class, we'll talk about dollar per cycle. In your mind, think of undergoing very regular cycles. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. 
So now you can loop out the problem is you undergo a real sort of regular cycle. So if, you, if all your cycling is very regular, then you'll see the voltage and current are change. So maybe, you know, to push in same amount of power, you suddenly need higher current. So you have an idea of the battery has degraded or health has degraded. But because you, you do something like this, so there's good chance you never seen the same operating condition before, right? So you don't know whether this is regular or not. Right? So if you have one of the newer uh, MacBooks so from Apple, it will say your battery tends to charge from this to this time. So I'm not gonna charge your battery right, right now. It doesn't charge to full immediately when you plug it in. I try to run some sort of that algorithm. It's not a very good algorithm, but for attempt at this kind of thing. It will say, I've seen this, you don't need to charge now, or I know you're gonna use it tomorrow. I'm gonna to charge very slowly at night. So there's a dynamic charging performance, trying to combat some of these issues. Right? So trying to basically to extend the life of the battery. So we're trying, but there's sort of still a simple algorithm stages. So with all that, we basically, you can get into a, a typical sort of mathematical formulation of energy storage. Okay, so what does mathematical energy formulation mean? In sort of some equations we can write down. So the equation we can write down will be something like, you'll minimize some objective. For example, minimizing cost or minimizing deviation from a wind turbine, this kind of thing. And what we're, what we're interested in is the charging and discharging of batteries. We're interested in the uh, constraints that has to do with batteries. So subject two, this we're gonna think of this power in or out of a battery. Okay, so we're going to put a notation to this. This is power in, or this is discharging. This is charging. Okay, so at this time, the power coming out of the battery as the amount that you discharge subtract the amount you charge. And this is where the power coming out of the battery. And then we also care about things like energy. Okay. So how much energy I have in the battery. So the reason we separate out charging and discharging is typically because the efficiency comes into a different ways. Okay, so this, so the efficiency comes into this way, basically. If you're discharging, right, if you're discharging a amount of PT plus, you need to pull more energy out of the battery. So that's the way to read it. You're dividing this number by something smaller than one. So what does this mean? At the output of the battery, I got PT plus. Okay, I got PT plus. But I have to pull more than this amount of energy from the battery. So I take an efficiency loss. Right, so I want to output one kilowatt of power. I may have to pull out, I say 1.1 kilowatt from the battery itself. So that's where this division comes in. This tells you if you're charging, if you try to put this much amount of power into the battery, this gets the efficiency hit. Okay, so let's say I'm, you know, I'm trying to put a kilowatt of power into the battery. I may only put 900 watts into the battery. Okay, so this is, so the ener energy is basically a summation of powers. Here is a summation of powers with efficiency, okay, with efficiency. Well, that's so, this is a, so we don't just write, for example, as this was 100% efficient, so you can just add them. But because no battery is 100% efficient, so one is gets divided, one gets multiplied, right? To make sure that you have an efficient loss both ways in the battery. Okay, so you have this sort of round trip efficiency loss. So you have loss both ways. This is the battery loss. 
And then we have, so next they're just a bunch of constraints we have, right? So we have, all this needs to be bigger than zero, right? We cannot, uh, so that's the commonly called a battery cannot charge and discharge at the same time. Okay, so I cannot both charge and discharge. The battery is either you know, putting out power or it's power going into the battery. So, This capital P, this is the power rating. So whatever you're doing cannot be more than this power rating. Energy has a, this kind of constraint, so it cannot be less than zero. The battery has to have, cannot have negative energy in the battery. And this is called energy rating. So that's the amount of, energy we have. And so this is sort of the equation we will use when we consider a battery. And so we won't get to sort of this full bunch of equation in this class, but there's something to in mind that sums up everything we talked about. So a battery, again, a battery is some device described. A battery is some device that uh, changes in time according to this rule, has an efficiency and power rating, and energy rating for us. This is our battery. So any type of chemistry for the battery, what happens, they just have a different efficiency number, different power rating number, and different uh, energy rating number. Okay, so this is our battery model. Okay, so, uh, so hopefully, so the goal we, again by next class and next week is to connect this with wind or solar and put things together. So, uh, so think of the uh, last, again, the last question and last homework have a more formal way of thinking about that, those type of questions, right? But for that, we need to sort of go through all this together. We need to go through the characteristics of batteries together. Right, so for degradation, so, it's, so it's the rest of this class, again, we want to look at degradation is because again, that's the biggest, barrier of using batteries sometimes. It's just, I lose a battery once I use it. So that's the biggest barrier. So degradation means that I don't have enough capacity, right? So I buy a battery, I buy a battery, and then after a while, I lose capacity, in the battery, and battery lose capacity. So one, this, on this picture, this is the thermal, Dependence. So this is the different temperature. If you keep a battery at a different temperature, you lose capacity in the battery, no matter whether you use it or not. Okay, so if, for example, if your battery is very hot, then if, if the battery sits there, it becomes a smaller, progressively smaller, smaller, smaller battery. I stay through this many years. So this has happened. We do see this, for example, in Phoenix. So uh, Microsoft has a data center in Phoenix. And the battery in that data center performs very differently than the batteries in the data center here. And that's mainly because of temperature. Yeah. Okay, so the higher temperature, the battery tends to lose its capacity by sitting there. Okay, so that's why you also have the air conditioning the battery. Okay, so the question now is, right, so you don't want your battery to start doing like this as the temperature goes up. Okay. And this is extremely bad for a battery is because you actually cannot use a battery once it goes to 60% capacity rate. Okay, so when we define the battery is dead or your phone software or computer software declares your battery is dead, where do you think the capacity, how much capacity do you think the battery has? 80%, so your battery is considered dead if it loses, 20% of its capacity. So if your computer software thinks, for example, your phone software thinks your battery has less than 80%, it will not charge. It will declare this as an inactive battery. It won't use it. Okay? So a battery is considered dead after 80%. So this is really, if you run something in Phoenix and you don't cool it, you won't have a battery after two years. Okay? You have no battery. And so this capacity fading is a big problem. So batteries 
are considered dead at 80% capacity. Yeah, you just we for safety reasons we won't charge the battery. You you won't be able to use the battery. Okay, so that that's the question. Yeah. yeah. Okay. You, you previously said that battery measuring battery capacity is really hard. So is that um, how how is how I just curious how is how is software done? Right. So software keeps a track. So it does a very conservative does a very conservative estimate how much battery you have. So when the declarator battery is dead, it's probably not at 80%, it's probably at 85 or something percent, but just will think it's at 80%. And so that's why when you buy electric vehicle, right? So, you know, sometimes you get a software update and suddenly your mileage increases by 20%. It's not that your battery is magically better. It's the software is better and measuring your battery, right? So, I, so if I, iPhone keeps talking about this sort of, you no, know, we have better, we have longer lifetimes, have longer, your iPhone can be used for longer with our charging. It's not really the battery got the matter, it's my software got better. I sort of know what is going on in my battery. And that is not a, you know, it's not a very good algorithm yet. Again, even today's algorithm is, if you take it, actually measure it, it's nowhere near what the software think is in the battery. It's just a very conservative measure for the software. Right? So, because this also comes, so there it isn't really the limiting factor sometimes when you use the battery. Okay, you, buy a, you know, buy a big battery, you forgot to turn on AC for a month and the uh, battery. Right? So 10% uh, of your capital money went away because your battery degrade. Uh, similar here, so there's a different picture. This is more operating cost. This is a number of cycles. Okay, so this is counting a number of cycles. And basically you look at this line, you see how many cycles you can throw. Okay, so in some operating conditions, for example, 20 degrees, you know, not yeah, yellow, so 20 degrees, very shallow cycles, you can survive for a long time. If you go very deep cycles, you don't survive all that. Okay, so this is again another degradation you have to think about. Okay, so this really is the, so when you look at the cost of batteries, you have to uh, really think about how you're using the battery, how you're cycling it. So that's why, you know, we all want our computer or phone to charge quickly. It will not because it wants to keep the battery alive. Okay, you cannot sometimes force it to do things. Right? So it just, and uh, so that's again, where the majority of the cost for battery comes in. It's not a capital cost. It's not the installation cost. It's more of, just, just don't survive for that long. Right, so you buy a normal car, the car, the engine runs for 10 years. You buy an electric vehicle, you have to swap out the battery, which is the most costly component of the car itself. Right? So that's a challenge we have. So nowadays, of course, they all give you warranties, right? You buy a battery, it gives you warranties. And uh, what this warranty tip, so if you actually look at the warranty of batteries as well, We'll go to 80% remaining capacity. So how do you count this? For example, if you did not use it at all, for, but you, the battery has been there for 10 years, we we'll declare that's the end of the life for the battery. If you cycle it once per day, we we'll declare as at a life of batteries after five years. Right, so these are the sort of warranties you have to keep track of how you use the battery and so on. But it will be much better if we actually have algorithm to exactly track the capacity. Right, you don't have to, to do this number of calculations, but again, we don't. Right? So being very conservative with this kind of calculation. Okay? So if you, you know, anytime you want to go out and buy a battery, we'll have all this kind of things. So we have a data sheet, we have all this kind of warranties on the data sheet. So, and this degradation is just very complicated to work out. Okay, so it just uh, very complicated. Depends on state of life, depends on battery efficiency, variation, nonlinear in cycles. All this is very hard to. It's complicated to get a handle when you're actually using it. So, if you want to do so, this is a graduate student. So this is from Professor. Who's at Columbia? 
So who was my student, who's now at the Columbia as a faculty member, we work a lot on this for battery assessment and uh, taking all this kind of into account. And he has this website where we can go and play this kind of battery. Right? So let's simulate if you're putting a different battery into a different condition, what happens? So he sort of, he spent his PhD working on this kind of stuff. Right? So uh, that sort of also shows you the sort of the level of complexity still, but yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So it could happen that so you have more. So typically, the narrower the cycle, the better. So it's not you have more storage. Every body can undergo narrow cycles. That's typically good. But the problem is more storage is they lose capacity anyway. So you have to balance between having lots of storage, but they're losing capacity anyways. So you won't get a benefit there. So every storage dies in four or five years. So there's just, that's a trade off that people have to make. So it's, there's just, yeah, a lot of complications. And the reason this is complicated, I guess, oh, I want to show you a picture of. So the reason this kind of degradation is complicated is if you look at the chemistry of this, what happens for this degradation is basically you think of this, you have two layers. You have a lithium ion battery. So you have a positive and negative sides, right? And what happens when you keep using batteries is they're not, so when you have, when you push lithium, what can happen is you have things start to form between the positive and negative sides of it. So you keep using it, this, this electrolyte, what happens is you have sort of this kind of plating, you can either have plating, for this kind of sort of formations, if you actually look at a picture, and this is your lithium ion basically building up on this plate. And so you lose capacity because what you want, you want a big gap in the positive and negative direction. So think of this as a capacity in first principles. You want this distance to be big, you have a lot of capacity. We, we, once you use that, you, this thing starts, this thing starts to build up. So effectively, you have a smaller capacity than you want. Right? So you, once you keep on using it, you have smaller, smaller capacitors. Effectively, all those things you know start to build up. So there's sort of very irregular growth within the battery. And uh, the reason why you need to so why do you want to stop the battery at eighty percent? Right. So once you have this kind of growth, this sort of lithium growth, you will look like you have a smaller battery. Again, your positive side will be closer to the negative side. But why would you want to stop at 80%? Right, so this more and more growth makes your battery look smaller. So what happens if you keep operating this and I say past 80%? What is the danger there? Right, so if you keep operating, what will happen to this kind of growth? If you keep operating, this will get close to the positive side and then you have a short. Right, so you worry about this kind of thing shorting your battery. So that's why you stop at 80%. Okay, so you're right. So even though 80% you think there's a lot of battery life, when you worry about this kind of thing shorting, once you have a short, that basically means fire. Right? So anytime you short the battery, this thing flow up. Okay, so this kind of grows. Degrade battery capacity. This kind of degrades the battery capacity by quite a bit. And uh, we stop at 80% as we was. To avoid shorting the battery. Okay, so that's typically how things catch on fire. And you have this kind of irregular growth, you get unlucky while this touches or gets very close. And then you have a negative rail touching, you have a positive rail touching the negative rail and the thing blows up on you. So that's why you think 80% is a huge number. That's because, you know, you, maybe all of them are short ones very long. 
you want to avoid those kind of things. So a lot of chemistry and battery technology is you know, how do I avoid this kind of growth? How do I make sure all of them are short? Or how do I, there's a lot of chemistry going on there. Okay, so that's a reason why we stop at 80% and now we, you know, not 50% or something. Okay. Is to avoid this kind of short for listening. And then different, of course, different listen technology. We have different growth patterns. You know, some are better, some are worse. There are a lot of people trying to avoid this kind of thing. So for, for example, listen metal. So listen metal tends to not have this kind of growth. So well, they tend to do there's some random sort of things that kind of show the back, the <laughs> normal operation. So there's different type outcome technology being talked about. Okay. So this is for our lithium battery. This is for our batteries. So again, we think of the battery as this bunch of equations limited by the degradation, both as the operating cost and as the amount of capacity you can use. Right in the battery. Okay. So we'll uh, stop here today for the class. This is what, and what we'll try to do is next class is we'll try to talk a little bit about economics. So this class we talk about the battery operation here. I didn't talk about this alternative. So these are the constraints. You know, what are my minima? What costs are my constraints? So next class we'll start talking about this cost and putting things together to give you a a very simple look into how you take a battery, minimize something that's red. That's a flavor. Uh, we'll try to get to you in the next uh, three lectures. We have that for this class. Okay. okay. So you probably see one more homework. Uh, maybe not released today, but maybe after Thursday's class. I have one more homework in this class. Okay. All right. Thanks, guys.